This tiny switch has four two and a half gig ethernet ports, one SFP plus 10 gigabit port plus a 10 G based T port. And what's even more exciting is that this has an onboard web management interface. And for someone that wants even more, we have a PoE version as well. Guys, these things are so cool that we're doing a special video for this one, so we'll, let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and these are the Hasvo S600 W and WP models. These things are so cool that even though we have a new mega roundup coming with well over a dozen two and a half gig ethernet switches that are low cost and family I still said, hey, these switches are so cool. We need to go pull these out and do a separate video just on these. And the reason that these are so cool is really simple. They have just about every feature you could want in a switch like this. Plus they're silent, they're cheap, and they're cheap to operate. Now I do wanna say thank you real quick to all the STH YouTube members who help us buy switches, but also help us buy all the other things that we need to go and test switches like this. If you wanna join our channel so you can help us go buy all the stuff that we need, that would be super awesome. You can do that down below. I also wanna point out though, that we do have an ultimate switch guide on the STH main site where we have, I think somewhere around three dozen switches and we'll be adding, we'll probably be getting to about 50 or so of these low cost switches. So if you just kinda of like see this and say, hey, I want something a little bit different, go check that out because we have a listing of tons of these switches that we've tested using the exact same methodology. But with that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, so taking a look at these two switches, we're gonna take a look at this one first, which is the Hasvo S600W4GT1SX1XGTSE. Now that is a complete mouthful, but it basically describes what the model number is and the port configuration. The 4GT tells us that we have four two and a half gig ethernet ports. Now two and a half gig ethernet is certainly becoming like wildfire. It's spreading like crazy into a lot of the systems that we see, even mini PCs. And one of the big things that we saw in 2023 was the price of the two and a half gig ethernet switches, especially these small ones, dropped dramatically in prices. This switch right here probably would have been about $500 in 2021. And now it's a fraction of that price. And the other thing that we get with these two and a half gig ethernet switches is we often now get 10 gig ethernet ports. So we've looked at a number of models that have eight two and a half gig ethernet ports and one 10 gig port. But this is a different model where you get four two and a half gig ethernet ports plus two 10 gigabit ethernet ports. Now the 10 gig ports on most models are SFP plus, especially on the very inexpensive models. And we do get an SFP plus module here. Now I know a ton of folks really like having 10 G base T because maybe their workstation or their NAS has 10 G base T on it. And it's easy just to go use a single cable. I totally get that. And in this switch, we also get that feature. But on the other hand, SFP plus is super useful because if you just need to run, you know, a longer run or something like that, or another big one is just if you want electrical isolation for things like uh, lightning and stuff like that, using an optical cable and having an SFP plus module is often a lot better. And since we know a lot of folks will ask this, the 10 G base T port can also support not just the 10 G base T, but also five and two and a half gig ethernet. So if you had like maybe, uh, you know, five, Five two and a half gig ethernet uh, devices today, you wanted one SFP plus as your uplink, but then you thought like maybe in the future, I'm gonna have another, uh, you know, I'm gonna have another 10G based T device. You could just pull it out of this port, plop in a new one and you're ready to go. When we get inside the switch, I'll show you the chipsets that make all this work. Now the other one is a kind of fun one. There's this little toggle switch where you see like we have web, we have dumb. And what that does is very simple. If you want a, uh, you know, completely unmanaged switch or just literally a dumb switch, uh, you take your switch and you move it over to you're dumb. But if you want to use the web management interface, well, then you go and you take this little switch and you pop it over to web. Now, of course, you're going to want to power cycle the thing anytime you make that switch. And it's just something that you should always do. But it's kind of cool that like, you know, if you just don't want to deal with having management or screwing something up, you can just go put it on unmanaged and or dumb and it's ready to go as a easy to use switch. And if in the future, you want to do things like set up VLANs and all that kind of stuff. Well, you could just go pop it over to web, turn it off, turn it back on, and you're ready to go. Now at this point, I want to get to the other model that you've been seeing sitting here. And that is the Hasvo S600WP4GT1SX1XGTSE. Yes, there's an extra letter and that P stands for PoE because this switch 
actually has PUE. You can see that we have little PUE indicators on the bottom, just below the ports. And that just tells us that, hey, you know, this port is using PUE if it is active or something like that. But in terms of the rest of the functionality, the port counts, port speeds, having that dumb or managed, um, you know, it's all exactly the same between the two switches, which makes a lot of sense. These things obviously are very similar. When we get inside, I'll show you the difference on how the PUE is delivered. Now, taking a look at the side of the system, you're going to notice that we get vents on both sides, but we don't get things like holes if you wanted to do something like rack mount a unit. So if you do want to rack mount these switches, your basic option is maybe getting a shelf or Velcro or something like that because you don't have rack ears. Getting to the bottom of the units, you also have mounting options. So if you have like screws in the wall or something like that, you can mount them using these two holes right here. But something that you uh, can't do, which is kind of a bummer out of the box, is these didn't come with little rubber feet. I wish that these came with rubber feet so they didn't go around and like mess up our table. It's a very little minor thing. And I know a lot of people are gonna mount these in different ways, but it also doesn't cost a lot of money to go put rubber feet in a box. Now, look at the back of the systems. You're gonna see mostly just a giant just panel. Uh, you will see that we have grounding points for both of these switches. Fun thing is that we don't see the grounding points on all the switches that we review. So that is a kind of small, but nice feature. And then you're gonna see our two power inputs. Now we're gonna get into this more when we get inside the systems, but the non-PUE version of course has a smaller power adapter than the PUE version. So these switches are very similar from the exterior, but let's show you what the difference is and how these switches are made when we get inside. Okay, now getting inside the switch is super easy. There are four screws, two on each side. You open it up and then you're inside. Before we get to the actual PCB, I just wanna take one second and make a quick note that if you take off the bottom clamshell, what we found in both of these switches is that there was a little thermal pad between where the main switch chip is and the bottom cover. So not only do you have a heat sink on the top side, but you also have this little thermal pad moving a little bit of heat to the bottom cover. Okay, so taking a look inside these switches, you're going to notice that we have both the non-PUE as well as the PUE versions here. And the overall motherboard on the bottom is very similar. We popped the main heatsink, which is blue. I love the fact that it's blue because of STH. And we popped that sucker off and there's a lot of thermal paste. But then underneath, we found a Realtek RTL 8372 switch chip. Now, the 8372 is one that we've seen a number of times. And if you see a four port, two and a half gig ethernet and two port, 10 gig ethernet switch, the vast majority of them are using this exact switch chip at this point. Now, aside from this little switch chip, the other thing I want to point out is this little chip right here. This little chip is the Realtek 8261BE. So what this little chip does is it takes the 10 gig signal from the RTL 8372, which is our main switch chip, and it converts it into 10 G base T. And one fun kind of thing on this is that uh, when you look up the, that model number, something you'll see is that you can actually get some models of these like SFP plus to 10 G base T transceivers. And those things will carry that exact chip. Now the PUE version is very similar. Of course, you're going to see that we have a little bit of a difference in terms of our power input. We'll have like more capacitors and stuff like that on the PUE version. And then we have the big feature, which is this little board. This little board is our Hazavo four port PUE board. And that's what allows us to have PUE on all of these different ports. There's one other little tiny tiny, tiny feature that is on the bottom of all of the ports on the PUE version of the switch, you get a little LED. That's what lights up that front panel LED port. And you don't get that, of course, on the non PUE version of the switch. A lot of people ask like, you know, why isn't this super cheap switch PUE? Well, one of the reasons is that to have a PUE switch, you need more components inside of the switch. And you also need things like a bigger power supply. With that, let's get to performance. Okay, so taking a look at the performance of these switches, this is something that we've seen a number of times because it's based on the RTL8372. You know, we get pretty close to line rate performance on all of the different ports when we go just blast traffic over it. And that's basically what we would expect. And also just one thing that we thought about was like, hey, I wonder if the unmanaged versus the managed one, if just flipping that switch would change the performance. And the answer is no, it did not. And we also wanted to see that on the power consumption side. So let's get to the power consumption next. 
Okay, you're gonna notice that we're not doing this power consumption section on our new set. We'll probably do that at some point, but we just wanted to kind of keep our methodology the same between all of these switches. So we wanna use the same power meter and all the same setup. So the first thing that we did was we wanted to see the power consumption at idle. The non-PoE version was about 1.3 watts, but the PoE version was higher at about 2.3 watts. Just for some context here, it's very common that we see PoE switches use a little bit more power than their non-PoE counterparts. The next thing that we did was we plugged in a two and a half gig ethernet port and we just lit that up just to see how much each incremental two and a half gig ethernet port would use. And on the non-PoE version, the answer was about one watt because we went from 1.3 watts up to about 2.3 watts. On the PoE version, we also saw an incremental one watt, but that was from 2.3 watts up to 3.3 watts. Now, since most of these switches have SFP plus ports, we generally will go and plug in like one of these SFP plus 10G base T adapters. And when we did that, we certainly see higher power consumption because this thing starts going and lighting up right away. So our non-PoE switch, we saw our power consumption raise again to three watts and our PoE version went up to four watts. And since this has 10 G base T on there, I said, hey, let's go plug that in and just kind of see what the incremental power consumption is for that as well. And on the non-PoE version, we added about 2.7 watts to get us up to four watts. And on the PoE version, we actually added a little bit more as a total of like three watts to get us up to 5.3 watts. So again, what we would expect with the PoE version using a little bit more power than the non-PoE version, but it's not necessarily like, you know, always like five times as much power or anything like that. It's uh, maybe a watt, two watts, somewhere in there. One other thing we wanted to see just real quickly was, was there gonna be a difference between if we did dumb and we pushed that little switch over to the web version? And when we did that, we saw on the non PoE version, pretty much the exact same. We saw 1.3 watts as our idle power consumption. And with our 10 G base T port lit, we saw four watts as well. So the just general thing that we saw there was that we got about the same power consumption between the two. There might be a small, you know, 0.1 watt, 0.2 watts, something like that difference, but it just feels like it's pretty similar between them. So maybe the key lesson there is that if it is using more power, it's using negligibly more power. And since we just crossed over to the web manage, well, let's go take a look at the interface. Okay, so logging onto the web management interface, you're gonna see that the IP address is 192.168.0.1. Now, of course, you can find that IP address on the bottom. And since this switch will be used by a number of different folks, a lot of folks, maybe home users, may not have a ton of experience with networking. Something that can happen with this specific IP address is that if you are using like a, a DSL or cable modem or something like that from your ISP, a lot of times that IP address range will be something that is your default gateway. For example, um, I think like the Cox Wi-Fi, I don't know if that's 100%, but if you're in the US and you have Cox uh, Wi-Fi, like all one router, you might actually end up use that, that 192.168.0.1 as your default. And that creates all kinds of problems on your network and it's not good. So what I would personally do is I would take this, I would take a machine, I would set your machine to 192.168.0.2. And then what I would do is I would set the IP address to something that's more useful. Now, of course, the web management interface on this is not gonna be you know, what you see on much higher end switches. It's not gonna be like a micro tick or something like that. This is gonna be a pretty basic setup. You still, if you wanna do something like have VLAN, great, you can do that here. This is also not gonna be the most secure interface. So that would be a reason that I think some folks might take that little switch and put it dumb and just say unmanaged. But if you do need things like being able to set VLANs or something like that on your switch, then you can do that in here. Also, if you have the PoE variant, there is a kind of janky way to be able to reset a PoE thing, which is important if you have something like a camera that froze and you need to reset it or something. With that, let's get to our key lessons learned. Now with all of these videos, I love to have a key lessons learned section. Like what did we learn by getting two of these switches, taking them apart, trying them out in all different ways? Like what do we learn from this? So I think the first thing is just uh, number one, these switches are pretty cool if this is the exact port configuration you need. I also think though that if you need things like PoE, I would get the PoE one. And uh, you know, if you need a different port configuration, I would get something completely different. There was one thing that we found when we were testing these that uh, I have to say I did not love. 
And that's something that somebody actually found and it was not us first. It was actually someone on the AliExpress review for this. They found that all of these are set up or manufactured with the same MAC address from the factory. So if you try putting two on the same network, that's just a, you know, layer two network or something like that, you're gonna have uh, issues, right? With two devices that are same MAC address. Hopefully at this point, they fix that in the manufacturing process, but we definitely saw that issue. And if you only have one of these, you probably just don't care. But if you do have a bunch of them, that is something that you're gonna care about sooner rather than later. The other side to these is just the pricing. These particular units are more expensive than some of the dual SFP plus module ones that we have reviewed and that we will review in the future. The non-PUE version is about $89. The PUE version though is about $120. And if you're getting this switch, I, I have a very kind of probably minority opinion on this, but personally I would go and get the PoE switch over the non-PoE one. And there's really a simple reason for that. At some point, you're probably gonna have a PoE device and when you do, it's easier just to go plug it in rather than having to go get a switch, an injector or something like that. Now, one kind of bummer with this is just the power adapter. Now, the non-PoE version comes with a 25 watt, 12 volt adapter, which um, is okay, whatever. But the PoE version comes with this, which is a 65 watt adapter. Who knows if they're real, but there are at least a lot of regulatory-ish looking markings on the bottom of this. The other challenge though, is that with a 65 watt power adapter, the amount of PoE that you're really gonna get on any of these ports is just not gonna be huge. I mean, you're not gonna be running a 90 watt PoE device or something like that, or PoE++ device on, uh, on a power brick that's 65 watts and also with a switch in the middle. We've already shown that you're gonna have at least five watts or over five watts just by plugging in the 10G base T to a 10G base T thing. And if you have a longer cable, of course, that's gonna be something a little different. If you have a SFP plus module in there, that's gonna use some power. If you just light up these ports, you're gonna use more power too. So you're probably talking about, you know, maximum of about 15 watts or so and you have a 65 watt power brick, which means that you only have about 50 watts for all of the PoE on the switch. Now, of course, at the same time, if you just have things like, you know, cameras or something like that, you're gonna have plenty of power within that power budget. But at the same time, if you're thinking like, you know, you're gonna run a lot of very high-end devices on this, you're just frankly not. A lot of like the highest end Wi-Fi 6E and Wi-Fi 7 APs are gonna use too much wattage for something like this. But on the other hand, a lot of the, um, you know, just kind of lower value or lower cost things or power things will run fine on it. And so a lot of folks are gonna ask like, you know, what is something like this for? And I just kind of use this as like, this is an awesome, like if you have a little apartment, you have a hot dog stand or something like that. This is super cool, right? You can have a couple ports, PoE, for like cameras or maybe something like that. You also have the connectivity to go connect a NAS as well as a you know desktop at pretty high speeds. And then you have another port that if you have like a one gig cable connection, you can go and put that on to one of the two and a half gig ethernet ports and you're all set. Now I know a lot of folks are gonna want higher port counts. We have stuff definitely coming for you. Just hold on for a bit. But if you just need a small, relatively inexpensive, fanless, quiet unit that doesn't use a lot of power, I think this has a lot going for it. And again, if you just wanna see something else, that's cool too we have an entire set where we've reviewed dozens of these with the exact same methodology. Of course, we'll link to that in the description. And also stay tuned because we have a number of two and a half gig ethernet videos that we're in the middle of filming and that you'll see pretty soon. But I just thought that these were cool, so we decided to do them first. And if you did like this video, well, why don't you share it with your friends and tell them how cool it is, but also give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.